Main Church. We are Mickey and Sarah, and this is the second Advent lighting. Today we light the candle of peace along with a candle of hope. Lighting the second candle reminds us of the complexity of what it means to feel peace this year. With a year full of uncertainty, anxiety, and fear, the peace candle invites us into a safe and secure place where we can just be. As we light the candle of peace, we acknowledge the times this year when peace has felt too far away. We acknowledge the times when our peace has felt insecure. We acknowledge our shared desire for your safe presence of peace as we continue in our Advent journey. And today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 3, verses 1 to 6. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice, call, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight path for him. John's cloth were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of peace that is found in Christ Jesus. Remind us of the safety and security of your peace as we enter into another week. Amen. Amen. Hello, Lavington Vineyard Church. Happy Advent to you, your family, whoever is watching with you. Today we begin our Advent sermon series on what is actually the second Sunday of Advent 2020. And every year at Advent, we try to put ourselves in the shoes of those who were longing for the coming of the Messiah. This is a season of anticipation, a season of longing, a season of waiting. And after such a year like the one we've had, I think for many of us, we are longing, we are waiting, we are anticipating something great. And so going from those who are waiting for the Messiah in his first Advent now, as we stand in our own shoes, we long for the second advent, the second coming of the Messiah, where one day he will put all things right. He will bring final and full justice and righteousness. And so in light, church, in light of what he came to do for us, let's now take a moment to confess our sins together. And so you'll see the confession there up on the screen. God of Advent, we praise you for sending light into this world. We confess that we live as though the light had never defeated darkness. We confess that too often we ignore the Savior you sent to be among us and to live in us. We've kept the birth of your Son confined to the Christmas season and do not yearn for his coming each moment in our waiting hearts. Forgive us for not opening our eyes to Jesus. Prepare us for his return. Help us rejoice in the light so that your grace can illuminate the darkened places of our hearts. Amen. And now, church, I want to invite you, as those words continue up on the screen, to take time to examine your hearts before the Lord this morning. If you're ready to take communion, whether you're a child or a young adult or whatever your age, if you're ready to take communion, let's examine our hearts before the Lord this morning. And now, sisters and brothers, receive these words of pardon. God does not remember our sins, but he does remember the promises which he made to us. God does not shame us, but lifts us to new life. So come now to the Lord's table with full assurance that your sins are forgiven. And walk back into this Advent season 
with a free heart. So now having come before the Lord, understanding what this meal is all about, and to confess our sins before Him, we now come to the table of the one who passed along to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's eat the bread together. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's drink the cup together. Amen. Amen, church. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, whenever we corporately as a body eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, that second advent. So may the Lord bless you and keep you during this Advent season as we celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ as that baby in Bethlehem, but also as we await the second Advent. So God bless you and may God bless the teaching of his word. May he encourage your hearts today. Amen. Good morning, church, and welcome to this Sunday morning. Whether you are near in Nairobi or far away, it is so good to be with you this morning. My name is Sarah Aronson, and I serve as an elder at Lavington Vineyard Church. And it is my joy and pleasure and honor to introduce our Christmas series today called Isaiah, the Prophet of Advent. So as we think about Advent, I want us to think about this word and how it has played a part in all of our lives this month and this whole year. Advent means coming. And with coming, there's expectations, there's eagerness, there's even an element of fear of the unknown. There's also waiting involved in that event that is coming. What are you waiting for right now? Are you waiting for a vaccine to roll out? In-person learning to begin? Waiting to start a new year and end this year of 2020? Students, children who are listening this morning, what about you? What have you had to wait for in your life? A birthday that's coming in a couple days or a few weeks? maybe exams in the near future. What is coming up that you are waiting eagerly for? What are some of the emotions and feelings that you have as you're waiting for this coming event? I always look forward to the time when I get to go and visit my mom and dad. There's preparation to do for that, counting the sleeps until we leave, wondering what will happen when I arrive, looking forward to certain foods, certain routines, certain events, an expectation of something coming. I ask these questions because this all relates to our season of Advent, a coming, waiting with expectations. This series that we're going to have for the next weeks of Advent is called Isaiah, the prophet of Advent. Let's think about that word prophet, prophet of Advent. In the New Testament, we find in Hebrews 1 verse 1 that the Bible says long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. God spoke. He uses his words and speaks truth. He spoke 
to us, to the community, through prophets. Prophets are those he used to speak his words. Isaiah is a prophet that we're going to look at. And this prophet Isaiah was given visions. The whole book of Isaiah is a sharing of the visions that Isaiah saw during the reigns of four kings in the southern kingdom of Judah. God allowed Isaiah to see. See himself high and lifted up and also see the nation in need of a savior. What do you and I need to see today? In 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, we are told that prophets foretold the coming of Jesus Christ. They were looking, waiting, expecting, not knowing all of the details, but they did it, spoke the words that God gave them because they were serving us. So Isaiah helps us to look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. And we wait during this season, wait with a longing for his arrival, wait with an expectation of his presence, and wait for the promised redemption, just like those Isaiah was speaking to. Let's come and see Jesus today throughout this season and through Isaiah, the prophet of Advent. Let's read Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep, deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled the, in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for speaking your words. Thank you for giving them to the prophets who spoke and saw you, who spoke your words and saw you. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see you and to see this child this morning that you have given to us. Lord, may you open our hearts and minds this morning to understand your word. Lord, Holy Spirit, work among us, each in our own homes. We love you, Jesus. Amen. So this morning we are going to take time to study in depth these seven verses. And there's three different sections in this passage today. The first is the current situation. The second is the response. And the third section 
is why we can have this response. So let's look at the situation that Isaiah is sharing with us today. And as we study all of these verses slowly, can you find any comparisons to your life, to our lives? Verse 1 that we just read starts with the all-important word, but. So we need to quickly understand what has happened for Isaiah to contrast the situation with that word, but. So what is the situation? Let's back up and read the last verses in chapter 8, verse, chapter 8 verses 21 and 22. This is a picture of what Judah will go through and how they will act. It says, They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward and they will look to the earth. But behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Doesn't sound very inviting. Distressed, hungry, enraged, darkness, anguish, thrust into thick darkness. Does this describe your year of 2020? There has been seasons of this darkness for our church family. Two families have had their children in near-death experiences. We've had job loss, marriages on the brink of ending and some that have ended, children with the loss of education, singles in isolation, constantly changing facts and protocols for this pandemic. Darkness, anguish, distress, emptiness, despair. Do these words describe you right now? Describe this season for you? As we start Isaiah 9, Isaiah points out a contrast. Let's read verse 1 again. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he had made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Let's look at these contrasts in these verses. First, there's a fact. There was a time of anguish, and now there will be no gloom. Agony, grief, heartache, misery. But now, contentment, hopefulness, gladness, and joyfulness. What a contrast. Verse 1 says we will move from anguish to contentment. Don't we all want to be living in that time of no gloom. It is coming. There was a time of conquest, of oppression. Zebulun and Naphtali was where the conquest of Judah, this nation, began. And in the future, there will be a time of glory, peace, rest, fullness. What will this look like for 2020? Maybe right now we could describe it as a time of loss, but in the future, a time of growth. Maybe right now a time of anguish, but in the future, hopefulness. Take time to reflect on this season and then pray for God to reveal his working in ways to bring out his glory and his reversal from anguish to joyfulness. And do you notice the last location that is mentioned in this verse? Galilee. This town points us to Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 uses this exact 
verse and tells us that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Jesus was from Galilee. We see that in Isaiah. So, we have now set this stage and laid out the current situation and we have seen a glimmer of hope, something different, a time of life with peace and rest. And when we experience this change in our lives and hearts, what does Isaiah say our response should be? Let's look at this response in verses 2 and 3. The response here is a hymn, a song of praise. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. In verse 2, we have another contrast darkness and light. Let's think about the worlds of darkness and the world of light. When we talk about darkness in this verse, verse 2, we see that there are verbs associated with it. Walked and dwelt. This is a continual movement, a habit, a practice, moving and settling in, getting comfortable. I think some of us could see this happening during the lockdown of the pandemic. We were all hiding in our homes and no one was around to see what was happening. Maybe we started buying more alcohol because we didn't need to show up in the office in the morning. Maybe we got in the habit of watching just one more show on Netflix so our bedtime was later or we watched shows that we normally wouldn't have and stayed up too late so we couldn't get up in the morning to spend time with God. Maybe now you've gotten to the habit of picking up your phone and are more addicted to the screen and communication on there instead of putting it down. Maybe your relationship with your roommates or your family are suffering because you've been in such close contact and the way you respond to one another is with sharpness. Are you walking and dwelling in darkness right now? What habit or pattern is making you dwell there? Let's look at the contrast now, the world of light. In this verse it says, they have seen a great light and on them has light shone. This light is coming from an external source. It's not from within them. It brings grace. It is nothing of our own doing. This light is talking of a future event, but it is declaring it with certainty. In light, there is comfort. You can know and see your surroundings. You can know and see yourself. Jesus says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And again in John, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In your darkness, in your present situation, Christ, the light of the world, comes to shine. This is a great light, not just a small glimmer. We've been lighting Advent candles, and the light is coming with each week we light them until the fullness of Jesus arrives. The light is getting brighter. Are you looking for the light? Are you seeing the light? Are you taking time to dwell in the light instead of the darkness? It is a grace. Grace 
given to you. You have the light of life if you believe in Jesus. And our response continues as we see this light with our hymn of praise. In verse 3, it talks about joy and abundance. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. There's three abundances in this one verse. An abundance of growth, where it mentions multiplied. An abundance of harvest. And an abundance of being the conqueror. These three items, they were fears of the nations. Would they be able to grow? Would they have a harvest? Would they be the one that dominates or would they be dominated? And yet, Isaiah says the light, the outside source, has brought this abundance. What are your fears? Not finding a spouse? not having children, not having work, not being able to go to school, getting sick? How will God turn these fears into a time of rejoicing? Christ has increased our joy. Christ has and is doing the work. Advent, coming, look towards the light, Wait in the light and respond with joy. So you might be saying, I understand the situation and I can even give a hymn of praise. But why should I give a hymn of praise? And how can I sing with joy? Isaiah doesn't stop with verse 3. He gives us, three reasons why the nation of Judah can have joy and therefore why we can have joy. Each of these reasons starts in these verses with the word for. So let's look at these three reasons why we can have joy and why we should have joy. There are three fours, verses four, five, and then six and seven. Verse 4 says, For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. This light, this you, brings freedom from oppression. That is our first reason why we can sing for joy. Freedom. From oppression. This verse points out a yoke. We each carry a yoke of sin, a personal responsibility, personal brokenness. We also have a yoke of oppression in our relations with one another. They are broken. We can see that on a day-to-day basis. But verse 4 points us to this you we saw in verse 3 who has broken the yoke. It is broken. There is a freedom from this sin, freedom from the broken relationships. At the end of this verse, Isaiah points us to the day of Midian. And if we go back in the Old Testament, Isaiah is pointing us to Judges 6 and 7 and Gideon. In this Bible story we read in Judges, Gideon is going into battle with just 300 men against a vast army of the Midianites. Gideon and his men only use jars and torches and God, God creates havoc in the camp of the Midianites, and they kill each other and flee. It is an improbable, improbable victory that Isaiah uses to point to God's power and control. Isaiah uses these historical events proving that there is a God who breaks oppression. 
Can you look at your life and see God at work? See a God of power, control, fighting for you, for me. If you don't have a personal story to look at and hold to, are you in community, a small group that will testify for you of God at work in your own life and their lives? We need these testimonies. God has broken the yoke, the staff, the rod. Look at the Bible and see this God of power. Verse 5, our second for, our second reason that we can sing for joy. For every boot, and then the last part of the verse says, will be burned as fuel for the fire. There is an end to war. That is our second reason that we can sing for joy. There is an end to war. In this verse, Isaiah points out interesting small parts involved in war, boots and garments, not the most important and critical elements in war, but every part that is involved in war will be finished and no longer useful because there is an end. There is an end to oppression. There is an end to war. Psalm 46 verse 9 says, He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Our third reason, our third four, verses 6 and 7. For to us, we are given a gift of grace in verses six and seven, and that is our third reason we can sing for joy. These verses are a birth announcement. These verses, verse six and seven, may be very familiar to you, but these are beautiful verses with clear truths. And so I want us to slow down and look at each phrase and see its impact on our lives. In the first line it says, for to us. Isaiah includes himself in this coming gift, in this coming promise. Isaiah is himself looking for this coming day of the gift of grace. Will you join with Isaiah today in looking for this coming day of grace? Second, a child. This phrase is contradictory to expectations. A child is vulnerable, humble, small, maybe even weak, not a mighty, valiant, noble man. But the gift of grace will come as a child. Third, this child is born. Now, usually we pass over that phrase quickly. Of course, a child is born, but this this is significant. This is key. This is crucial to our understanding and to our God. This child is born, is fully human. Ah, wonder. God took on flesh. Fully God, fully human. And finally, this son this child is given to us, given, a gift. Have you ever reflected that you have been given a gift from God, a gift of grace, a gift of the Son of God, born as a baby, given to you? The second half of the verse includes the names this child shall have and be called. Think about the importance of this naming. If you are a parent, how did you choose the name of your child? Did you consider this meaning and ponder what name will fit your unborn child and their yet to be known personality? Here, Isaiah gives four names for this child that is to be born. They are powerful and create an image of the man that he will be. Let's consider these four names. Wonderful Counselor or the Wonder of a Counselor. 
Remember, the nation of Judah has had kings that were currently foolish, untrustworthy, selfish. But this babe, this child, will be a wonderful counselor, full of wisdom and truth. Later in Isaiah, he says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. How we need the wonderful counselor today. We need his wisdom and understanding. And in all of his wisdom and understanding, he is wonderful. Mighty God. At the beginning of the verse, we read that this child will be fully human as he is born. And here we read that this child will be God, mighty God. This is a name that God used, used to describe himself to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 10 verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. This child is fully human and fully God, mighty God. Everlasting Father. The title Father here is not referring to God the Father, the name we often use when referring to the Trinity, but it is used to create the image of protection that a king offers and provides for his people. He is a protector of his people without end, everlasting, enduring, Prince of Peace. He will bring about the peace that the earlier verses, verse 4 and 5, talked about. The freedom from oppression and the end to war. Shalom. Fix the broken relationship between God and man. And the broken relationship between man and man. His peace brings restoration and completeness. Makes right of all wrong things. Nothing is missing. Ephesians 2 verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace. Our final verse addresses the royalty of this child and describes the type of reign he will have in his kingdom. Let's look at what we learn. There will be no end to his kingdom. This is not a moment in time. This is not something that has already been completed. This is for all eternity. There will be no end. The royalty and line of this kingship can be traced through the line of David. This is another place where we can see the beauty of God's word and his storyline of sending a rescuer from the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 3, we are told of an offspring that will crush Satan. Genesis 12, Abram is told that through him all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 49, Judah is blessed by Jacob and told that there is a king coming in his line. 2 Samuel 7, David is told by God that he will have an offspring that God will establish and the throne of his kingdom will be for forever. And then in the New Testament, we see Matthew trace the line of Jesus, starting with Abraham through David to Jesus. God has been working from the very beginning and is working today, sending us his son. Finally, what stands out about Christ's kingdom? Justice and righteousness. From the very beginning, people are crying out for justice and righteousness. Today, we cry out for justice and righteousness. In this year, we have seen the lack of justice and righteousness through the deaths in the U.S. of our African-American brothers and sisters. And the demonstrations, our cry to fight the systemic racism in our society. 
We have seen it, the lack of righteousness and justice in the police brutality in Kenya. This is lacking in our world and our hearts ache for a place and time when justice and righteousness will reign. It is coming. How will all of this be? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Our passionate, involved, active Lord of heaven's armies will do this. So in conclusion, what can the prophet of Advent mean for us today? What can we see? We join with other brothers and sisters around the world in this season of Advent in December 2020. We celebrate and remember the expectation and celebration of our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, born, born as a child for us. We see Jesus of Galilee. We see Jesus bringing light and joy. And we look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the new heaven and new earth that we get a glimpse of in Revelations, where we will see the complete fulfillment of Isaiah 9, where we will live in a land of light that has no outside source, where there is freedom from oppression, where there will be no war, where we'll, we will be at the royal throne of the Prince of Peace, where his reign will continue forever and ever. Today, December 6, 2020, we cry out and wait. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, you are our wonderful counselor. You are our mighty God. You are our everlasting father. You are our prince of peace. Open our eyes so that we may see you this Advent season. Lord, show us the light that is shining into our darkness. Help us lift our eyes and look for that light. Thank you for being the light and coming as a babe. Amen. Thank you for listening and may you have a wonderful Advent season.